Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this space. We thank you for this time. And I thank you for Andrew, who has been reading and and studying and exploring your word. God, and I pray that the words that you have spoken to him, uh, that you would now speak into our hearts, that you would speak into our lives, that they would challenge us, that they would change us, that they would make us a little bit more like Jesus. God, just pour out your spirit on him uh, and use him in this space, we ask in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Hope you're doing well. We're nearly, we're over halfway through winter, so that's, I guess that's a good thing on the downhill summit. Um, It's great to be here again. Um, Yeah, it's a real joy and a privilege. I had a couple of people come up to me before the service and say, oh, this is a tough passage, and I thought, oh, man, (laughs) I'm on edge now. I wonder if any of us here have ever felt really weak. I don't know, some people after COVID, they physically feel very weak. I don't know if that's been your experience. But I wonder if sometimes in your, with wherever you're at in life, you just feel weak. You feel like I'm inadequate for the circumstances that are before me. Um, I'm actually going to Marvel Stadium later this afternoon and I'm going to watch my team Carlton play and they've been the epitome of weak for 20 years. Um, But apparently God's power is made perfect in weakness and so hopefully today is the day. But I'll never forget going to that same stadium, Marvel Stadium, about three years ago for a very different reason. There was a speaker um, there, an evangelist named Nick Wojcik. And he's an Australian guy, actually born in Melbourne, but travels all around the world. And it was an amazing um, message of the gospel that he, he proclaimed. And literally dozens, if not hundreds of people responded. And it was amazing. Now, what made it significant was that this guy was born, and I'm not joking, with no arms and no legs. And, but, and obviously, he was just rejected and ridiculed as a baby as he was growing up. And yet, when he was about 17, this thought took hold of him that maybe what the Bible says about God using weak people, maybe that's true. And he started to speak. And he's now spoken to, it's believed, over 10 million people. And thousands upon thousands of people have been saved through his preaching. And I guess we we can either feel helpless sometimes Or we can grab hold of the fact that God does, in fact, use weak people. Um, I feel like, or I wonder, it's probably a time when people in the church can feel weak. I don't know if you've seen in the news the last few weeks the the census data came out, and it's been on the news how people have ticked the, the religious question. And we've seen that, not that that means anything. I mean, Vladimir Putin would have ticked the Christian box. I'm not sure that really means much. We know that people who tick that box, they may or may not be following Jesus. Probably not in a lot of cases. But the headline numbers showed that 44% of Australians would identify as a Christian. It's actually a reasonably high number, but only 10 years ago, it was 61%. It's a huge drop. And on the other hand, those reporting no religion went from 22% 10 years ago up to 39% in the latest census. Now, I should say, if we take a broader, more global view, it's the exact opposite. Christianity is growing way more, those identifying as Christians are growing way faster um, than no religion, over six times faster than atheism, which is expected to decline. Nevertheless, here in Melbourne in particular, things have changed. It's like the, the, what the world is like now compared with 10 years ago, is the difference is amazing. And not just the, the church seems like it's on the back foot, on the decline. But also culture has changed. What, what was good, considered good some years ago, may be considered unmentionable now. Well, what was considered uh, bad some years ago is now encouraged and it's possible I think that Christians in this setting and I've met people who, who, there's a despondency there's a weak to feel like we're, we're just on the back foot we're weak we're hopeless I wonder whether we've ever felt like that or maybe we feel like that we feel weakness just in our day-to-day life it's interesting that in Ephesians chapter 1 Paul says he prays constantly for that church. 
And the thing that he says he prays for, he says, I'm praying that God would give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation that you would know. And in particular, he says that you would know God's power that's at work in you and available to, to you. And that's been my prayer for us as I've looked at this passage. Because what we see in this passage, uh, very well read, I might add. Is a t- there was a lot of reading to do and you, it was read really powerfully. We see God's power. I wonder whether you've seen the, um, some of the pictures from that new telescope, the NASA telescope, the, the James Webb telescope. It's looking um, across the universe And you see these pictures of, of, you know, galaxies circling one another. It's good sometimes to take a step back and just consider the awesome power of our God. And that's, I think, what we can do with this passage. Now, as we come to think about this passage uh, and the plagues, uh, it's helpful to remember the people of Israel are in a very real sense seeing God for the first time. The nation of Israel uh, hasn't really experienced much of God yet. And they say first impressions matter. So this is God's first impression to the nation of Israel. Um, I I remember years ago, probably around the time when I was mucking around with stereo, I was out one night and uh, I'm sure it would have been a church event, I can't remember, and I was talking to a a couple of girls. Not uncommon, of course. Um, (laughs) Except when Steery was in the room, then you'd, you know, wouldn't get a look in. But um, I was talking to a couple of girls. One I knew, the other I didn't. And I tried to strike up a conversation with the one that I didn't know. And she gave me nothing. And I felt maybe she was a little bit rude. And then I met her again a little while, a, a few weeks or months later. She gave me nothing again. And that was my first impression of my beautiful wife, <laughs> who I've been married to for 20 years. Israel had been stuck in Egypt for 400 years. They've grown from a family to a nation. And during that time, we don't hear of any um, uh, word from God from them. We don't know if God um, did any uh, miracles amongst them. So here God turns up um, and he's giving his first impression to them. And you remember back in chapter 5 when Moses first went to Pharaoh, um, he said... To, to Moses said to Pharaoh, um, this is what the Lord said. You would have looked at this the last couple of weeks. This is what the Lord says. Let my people go. And Pharaoh said, who is the Lord that I should obey him? Who is the Lord that I should obey him? And that's the question, isn't it? That's the, that's the key question. Why should we? And maybe there's some here who are wondering the same thing. Maybe you think, why, why am I bothering to follow Jesus? Why do I bother turning up to church? Maybe you wouldn't be here if someone didn't drag you along. And what's more, put yourself in Pharaoh's shoes, Egypt had hundreds of gods. So you can imagine you thinking, why should I follow this one? I remember uh, about uh, 10 years ago, I went to a debate between a Christian and an atheist. Uh, the Christian was, his name was William Lane Craig, and the atheist was Lawrence Krauss. And I remember the the first argument that the atheist, Lawrence Krauss, gave. He said that over the years, uh, for thousands of years, there's all thousands upon thousands of gods which no one believes in anymore. He says, back in the day there were ancient pagan gods and Egyptian gods and Roman gods and Greek gods and no one believes in them anymore, so why should I believe in this one? It's a good question. And so what we see here, and this is the purpose, I think, of the plagues, or one of the purposes. Before the exodus, before the the covenant that Israel are going to make with God, before the promised land, before all of that happens, God wants to answer this question. Who is the Lord that I should obey? And so what I want to do is make two very simple observations. They're very simple about what we see through these plagues and the demonstration of power that we see. The first thing is that we see God's supreme power. This is, this is simple stuff. 
Think about God's game plan. You probably would have looked at this um, a while ago. Uh, God doesn't send an army. He doesn't send a you know, key crack negotiator to try and um, you know, get the people out. He sends two 80-year-olds and a stick. That's his plan. That's all he sends. Two 80-year-olds and a stick. Nothing against 80-year-olds. My dad's 80. Uh, that's, that's great. It, it seems like a terrible plan, except that God's goal is to make absolutely sure that everyone knows where the power's coming from. He wants there to be no doubt. And the first thing we see is that God, God has supreme power over creation. This is obvious to see, isn't it? So first, as we, uh, as we heard before, Moses turns water into blood. We didn't read all of these, but then he, he creates a plague of frogs, and then there's a plague of gnats, and then there's flies, and then there's disease on livestock, and then there's uh, boils on people, and then there's a hailstorm which destroys most of their crops, and then lake, a locust plague which destroys everything, eats everything else, and then God sends darkness. He says a darkness that can be felt for three days. And so God shows that he has control over water, over land, sky, insects, livestock, disease, the weather, crops, life, death, and even light. He shows he has power over everything. Now, why did he do that? Over and over again, he says why he he does it. Uh, Let me read um, chapter 10, verse 1 and 2. He says, Go to Pharaoh, for I have hardened his heart and the hearts of his officials, so that I may perform these signs of mine among them, that you may tell your children and your grandchildren how I dealt harshly with the Egyptians and how I performed my signs among, you, among them, so that you may know that I am the Lord. So he has power over all creation. But also God shows that he has supremacy and power over Egypt's gods. Now it's helpful to know that the Egyptians believed in hundreds of gods and they controlled various aspects of nature. So there were gods for water and gods for animals and gods for livestock and gods of the weather, all sorts of gods. And it was even believed that they had gods represented um, by insects and frogs. Which, which ties into some of the plagues. And their chief god was Ray, the god of the sun. And it's if God is saying, see, he's picking off their gods and saying, you know what, I'm more powerful than that one, more powerful than that one. And did you notice even um, that in the first couple of plagues, if you read through them, the first three things that Moses did, the staff became a snake and then there was the, pl- the water became blood and the plague of frogs. In each of those times... The, the Egyptian magicians came along and they could do the same thing. Now, we don't know whether that was trickery or whether they'd tapped into some you know, spiritual force. We don't know why, but they could, they could match those things. And it's as if um, God is deliberately setting this up so that it's a, a contest of God. You've got the God of Israel and the gods of Egypt. Who's going to win? But by the third plague... It all breaks down for them. In 8.17, it says, Aaron stretched out his hand and the staff, uh, with the staff and struck the dust of the ground. And gnats came on people and animals. But when the magicians tried to produce gnats by their secret arts, they could not. And the magician said to Pharaoh, this is the finger of God. In other words, God of Israel wins. It's over. They can't do any more. I was reminded, I think the Tour de France ends tonight. I don't know if there's any people who stay up late and watch that. I'm not a cyclist, I haven't ridden a bike for 20 years. But there's this moment, now I know Lance Armstrong is a drug cheat, but we'll just put that out of your minds for a minute. There's this cool thing, you could could, um, Google it later. It's called The Look. Do anyone, any cyclist? fans know this, Lance Armstrong is riding along and they're just about to climb this hill at this important point in the Tour de France and his main rival is right behind him and he looks around and he just looks at him as he's riding along for a few seconds and it's as if he's saying, right, I'm going to go, can you stay with me? And then he just takes off. It's like he's riding downhill but he's still riding uphill and the guy is just left as if he's standing still. The same thing is happening here between God and the Egyptian 
magicians. It's over. God has power over, over Egypt's gods, over and above them. And the th- another way that we see God's power is that we see his power over Pharaoh himself. Now, before this all began, back in the early parts of chapter 7, God said that he, God, would harden Pharaoh's heart to accomplish his plans. Now, this is interesting because Pharaoh himself was considered a god to the Egyptians. So this is significant that God is saying, no, no, I'm going to harden his heart. In other words, he is under God, he's under God's control. He's not above God. Proverbs 21.1 says, The king's heart is the stream of water in the hand of the Lord, and he turns it wherever he wills. Now, sometimes this can cause difficulty in our, in our minds, can't it? I think this points to the fact that God is free and powerful enough to do whatever he pleases with his creation. And we might not like that freedom, but that is the reality. He is free to do what, with his creation and the people on his creation, whatever he wills. And in fact, Romans 9 talks about this very thing and it uses Pharaoh as an example. Let me just read what Paul says about this. From Romans chapter 9, he says, Scripture, or God, says to Pharaoh, and he quotes Exodus here, I raised you up for this very purpose, that I might display my power in you and that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. Therefore, Paul says, God has mercy on whom he wants to have mercy and he hardens whom he wants to harden. Now, one of you will say to me, then why does God still blame us for who is able to resist his will? But who are you? This is, what, this is Paul's answer to that question. It's not a very nice answer, but this is how he answers it. But who are you, a human being, to talk back to God? Shall what is formed say to the one who formed it, why did you make me like this? Does not the potter have the right to make out of the, his lump of clay essentially whatever he wants. So he's saying we need to grapple with the fact, to realise the fact that God is not only so powerful, but he's free to have sovereignty over all things. And here he chooses to harden Pharaoh's heart. Now I know some of, I can hear the wheels turning, but some of you will be saying, well, what about our will or Pharaoh's will? Or our will? Don't we make choices? This raises the question of, you know, God's sovereignty versus human will uh, and responsibility. Um, And I had this whole section that I was going to say, and then I thought, no, um, I shouldn't do that. That'll be, I'll put 90% of you to sleep. So you can come and ask me about it either, but I'll just say this one quick thing. Um, You'll notice as you go, if you read through the plagues, You'll notice sometimes it says that Pharaoh hardened his heart and other times it says that God hardened his heart. So it's almost like you see um, human choices and God's sovereignty in the same context. They're both happening. And I believe if you read the Bible, you'll see both. You see God is sovereign over all things and you see human will and, and uh, responsibility on the other. And I believe both work all the time and are mysteriously work together. That's my short um, paraphrase of how that works. All that to say, God is powerful and he has power over creation, over Egypt's gods and even over Pharaoh himself. And the second observation I'd like to make from this, these plagues and from this passage, and this is much shorter, um, is that we see God is judge. God is the judge. Sometimes we don't like to talk about this too much, but it's unavoidable in this passage, and I don't think we should avoid it. We see God's just judgment against Pharaoh and Egypt. These plagues, did you know, become the imagery that the rest of the Bible uses for judgment. We see it all through the rest of the Bible. If you go to the book of Revelation you'll see most of the plagues referenced in the context of discussing and describing God's judgment. Uh, If you look in one of the plagues, soot is, uh, Moses takes some soot from a furnace and throws it into the air to produce a plague. And and that imagery of a a furnace, a fiery furnace, is used for judgment 
throughout the rest of the Bible. You see a, a huge hailstorm where, where people are warned, um, you know, come inside, you've got to prepare yourself, fear the Lord or the storm's going to get you. And then you see Jesus, if you read the Sermon on the Mount, it ends, he, he describes judgment through the metaphor of a storm. This is judgment. And we see here God's just judgment on Egypt for their years of cruelty, but also, more specifically, because of Pharaoh's disobedience. And if you, if you look at the way that the, uh, the plagues are, are framed, God will say this over and over again. He'll say, let my people go or else. And the, the consequence is a consequence of him disobeying this command. That's what's going on here. And it's interesting, in the New Testament, Jesus says the kingdom of God's coming, but he always, if you read the parables, it, it will happen through a judgment. Judgment will happen first. There will be a time when those who fear God are divided from those who don't and those who reject him. And so we see that Pharaoh disobeys. And we see him disobeying in three different types of, in three ways that we might be able to relate to. First, and it especially happens at the start, he simply says no, he ignores God. If you're wondering, how do you harden your heart? What does that look like? You just ignore it. Just forget about it. Just don't take any notice of God. Maybe it's going to cost us too much and we don't want to think about it. Or maybe we think we know better. I think this is common today. Maybe we're starting to think, well, you know, the God's word, it's old, it's antiquated. We've got to update it. We've got to, you know, we want to be on the right side of history. You don't want to, you know, be controlled by this ancient book. Second, we see that he'll, um, we see that he says he'll obey and he says he's going to repent, but then he just doesn't do it. In eight, chapter 8, verse 27, he says, This time I've sinned. The Lord is in the right. And I and my people are in the wrong. I will let you go. Well, that sounds promising, doesn't it? But then he just doesn't do it. And I wonder whether any of us here can relate to that. Jesus calls this for somebody who says something but actually does something else. It's a hypocrite. I wonder, do our actions match our words and intentions? And the third thing we see, um, the third type of disobedience that we see, is that he tries to bargain with God with a kind of partial obedience where he says, okay, you can go, but just, just only the men. Or you can go, but leave, it, leave your livestock behind. And Moses says, no, it's full obedience. So we see Pharaoh disobeying. Um, and so God punishes him. But I want us to point out, I was reminded when I was looking at this of a verse in Romans 11, where Paul is reflecting on how God dealt with Israel in the Old Testament, and he says, Consider the kindness and the sternness of God. Kindness and sternness. Sternness to those who fell, that is, who disobeyed and walked away from him, but kindness to you, provided that you continue in his kindness. Now, consider God's kindness, even to Pharaoh and the Egyptians here. I know the plagues are cruel, but consider the kindness that God shows them in his judgment. He waited so long, it was 400 years, hundreds of years of slavery that they'd enacted. He came and told Pharaoh first. Moses went to him, didn't he, and just asked him, just said, please. There's no threats. There's no... He asked him, but Pharaoh said no. He made demonstrations of power, but still Pharaoh just said no. He warned him before the plagues. He said, hey, I'm going to do, if you don't let them go, this is what's going to happen. He warned him, gave him plenty of warnings and the, pl and the plagues ramped up. They didn't start at the most brutal. And each time Pharaoh just says no. So God was actually showed his kindness, but we've also got to be brutally honest and see the sternness of God's judgment on the Egyptians. Imagine being in that place. Imagine being literally with the Egyptians here. There's, there's no water to drink. Everything stinks of blood. There's swarms of insects. Your livestock's dead. Your, your crops are destroyed. There's no food for the year to come. 
People are covered in painful boils. Some die and then there's total darkness. And in the end, Pharaoh's officials come to him and they say, Egypt, the greatest superpower in the world at that time, is ruined. It's ruined. And that word is interesting because we see that word or or the same meaning in John 3.16. You know that verse, God, loved, God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever trusts in him shall not perish. Now, it, it's, trust me, it's the same, same word, the same meaning behind it, saying shall not be ruined. And it's as if John's saying, hey, remember what happened to Pharaoh. This is a picture, this is a literal picture of, of being ruined or a, a, a physical representation of being ruined. And John is saying, don't let that happen to you eternally. But also consider God's special kindness to Israel. Did you notice they are spared the plagues? God lavishes his kindness on his people. And if you're in Christ today, then that's us. Consider the fact that God spares us from that. I remember once years ago before I was married, I was working in the UK and me and a couple of mates did a road trip around Ireland just in, um, for a couple of days. And I found myself, I don't know if any people here have seen The Princess Bride, we found ourselves at where they shot the cliffs of, you know, the cliffs of insanity. Anyone know what I'm talking about? So the cliffs of mohair, I think they're called. And it's just a, it, it's a cliff face um, looking out into the ocean is this sheer cliff face, hundreds of feet deep, and there's just brutal rocks and waves crashing against the rocks below. And it just goes on for miles either, either way. It's an amazing place. And I remember coming up to it, you, you just tiptoe up to the edge and you'd see just looking straight down hundreds of feet and you think, oh, what might be if my foot slipped, if I took one more step, what might be? And, you know, it's the same with us when we think about judgment. What might be if Christ didn't save me? So we see in these chapters the power of God and the judgment of God. As we draw to a close, I just want to leave you with, um, I guess, a warning and a wonder to finish on. Why think about judgment? Why think about it? Why bring it up? One, I think that's what the plagues are. They're they're a demonstration of power, but they're also judgment. I think it's what the text says. But Psalm 73 gives us good reason why we should consider the judgment of God. It says this, But as for me, the psalmist says in Psalm 73, But as for me, my feet had almost slipped. I had nearly lost my foothold. That is, he'd nearly given up on God. Why? Why? He explains, for I had envied the arrogant and saw the prosperity of the wicked. And in verse 12, this is what the wicked are like. They're always free of care. They go about amassing wealth. Surely in vain I have kept my heart pure. In other words, he's saying, when I look around and I see the crowd going that way, they don't take any notice. You know, all the people around me, they're going in a different direction. They don't, they don't care about God's laws. They're, they're just doing their own thing and they seem to be, you know, they get along fine. The sky's not falling in. They're probably richer than me. They're happier than me. They're probably not true, but that, that was his perspective. And he says, when I tried to understand all this, it troubled me deeply. I mean, why bother? Why bother? It troubled me deeply until I entered the sanctuary of God and then I understood their final destiny. In other words, he, he, he remembered who God was and that God, amongst all of his other titles and everything else God does, that God is the judge. In other words, he remembered that every one of us will face God one day. Every one of us will. How are we going to stand? So what should we do? I think we should do the exact opposite of what Pharaoh did. You know, he hardened his heart. And Hebrews 3, 7 says, Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart. No, my word would be, take the grace while you can. If there's something that God's put on your heart, if, he, if you haven't given your life to him, if he's calling you to give up a sin, 
there's some sin you've been it's been getting a hold of you if there's been some call on your life to give some service don't harden your heart do it now do it now and finally the wonder next time we're feeling weak we got to remember there's no one like our god Next time you begin to pray, I wonder whether we could just stop and remember there is no one like our God. I was convicted by this question this week. What would my prayer, what would our prayer look like if we actually took to heart this power, the unsurpassed, unlimited power of God and he's our father? One story to close. Um, Dwight L. Moody uh, was a well-known preacher and evangelist in America in the 1800s. And at one point, after many years of constant preaching and constant work, he found himself very tired. And in 1972, he decided, I need a rest. And he went to London, and he was going to take a bit of time off. No preaching. He'd resolved not to preach. But when he got there, someone kind of talked him into preaching at their church in North London. A a pastor by the name of Lessie had just kind of cajoled him into preaching at his church. And Moody had agreed. And it was a morning service and an evening service. And so he preached at the morning service and he said, he he reports it was just cold, unresponsive. He didn't want to be there. They didn't want to be there. It just nothing happened. There was no response. And he, he, he'd realised, yeah, I really do need this holiday and I'm not going to preach anymore. I'll, I'll do the night service I committed to. Now, it happened, unbeknownst to anyone, that a young woman who was bedridden had been praying for some time for a revival at her church, which was that church, and to send Moody, who she'd read about, to come and preach. And her sister, who also cared for her, had been at that service and she came home and she told her that Moody spoke. And this bedridden woman called out and she said, God has answered my prayers. And then she said, don't bring me any more food. I'm praying and fasting for the rest of the day. And then when the evening service came, Moody gets up to preach. He had no idea about any of this. Everything had changed. And the spirit moved. And hundreds, literally hundreds of people responded. There were so many people coming. There was so much interest. They put on events for the next week or two. And hundreds came to the Lord. There was a revival broke out in this part of London. And then it spread across the UK. And Moody ended up preaching literally to crowds of up to 20,000 throughout the UK. Started with this service. And it all because a weak, bedridden woman had seen the wonder of the power of God. Let's pray. Oh God, I pray like Paul prayed for the Ephesians that you would give us a greater revelation of your power, that it's available to us and that you want to use us even in our weakness. And I pray that you would remind us that You are sovereign and that you will judge and the wonder of being saved by you, that that would melt our hearts. Oh, Lord, would you move with power through this church? Would you build them up and bless um, Camberwell Baptist? In Jesus' name, amen.